What's happening, Cardinal Nation? Welcome back to the Cardinal Call Podcast, a classroom podcast where we interview expert leaders that help take your leadership and your learning to the next level. Let me start off with a quote today. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. That was stated by Helen Keller, who was an author, disability rights advocate, political activist, and lecturer. With March being National Women's History Month, you don't want to miss any of the great women guests we have this month. We will interview some of the top female leaders in the community and the university. They are doing phenomenal works, and you don't want to miss this National Women's History Month edition of the Cardinal Call podcast. I am Dr. C. Sean Owens, also known by my social media monikers, whoops, as you can see somewhere on my screen, at the Professor Owens, where you can find me hanging out and hiding out and making some great posts out there. And today I want to bring in my co-host, the incomparable, the one, the only, Dr. Andrew McCart. Dr. McCart, how you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, Dr. Owens. Thank you for that warm introduction. And um, we need it with the weather outside. Good to have a warm introduction. And I'm glad to be here. Um, as our listeners know, a big part of our organizational leadership and learning program is a healthcare leadership track. And we have a, a great healthcare leader with us today. Uh, oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So she's leading high performing teams. Uh, she's doing great research and I don't want to take away your introduction. I've got a bad habit of doing that and uh, stealing your thunder, but sometimes I get excited and uh, can't help myself. So I, I'm glad to be here. This is going to be a, a very interesting interview. It's impossible to steal my thunder. We're, we're, we're a team and this is what we do. But before we jump into today's classroom podcast with our special guest, I want to let our listeners and viewers know this. That if you or someone you know wants to learn to lead with compassion and expertise in a changing world and obtain a degree from award-winning faculty within a nationally recognized program in the area of leadership and learning, go to uofl.me backslash B-S-O-L-L dash podcast. Now that we've got that out the way, let me introduce our very special guest today. She is the Surgeon-in-Chief of Norton's Children's Hospital and the Chief of Pediatric Surgery at the University of Louisville. So she knows a thing or two, as Dr. McCart said, about leadership and leading and building high performance teams. She's a guru of things connected to pediatric surgery and trauma, but I will let her tell you all about those things because she's an expert in things I can't even pronounce. She's a mom. She's a wife. She's a leader. And also for those out there, she's a tennis aficionado and she is a native of the great city of Louisville. So get your pens, get your pencils, get your notepads, your iPads, your memo boards, whatever you take notes with. Get ready to learn from today's special guest, the one, the only Dr. Cindy Downer. Dr. Downer, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Appreciate That's the opportunity. Ha, huh, we are uh just thrilled to have someone of your caliber as as the guest today. I I can't begin to I mean, your resume is phenomenal by the way, just FYI. We could talk just about certain highlights, but we'll try to cover all of it. Um but here on the the Cardinal Call podcast, you know, we kind of like delving into leadership and learning and, you know, for our listeners, we know we like to have a little fun with our guests as well. But um, let me uh, let me start off by this. Let me ask you this first question. Right. So leadership consultant Warren Bennett said that leadership is a capacity to translate vision into reality. That being said, Dr. Downard, how do you define leadership? Well, I think being a leader, you have an identified person usually or a team that is a leadership team or a leadership person mm -hmm. that group's job is to, as you said, to to translate the vision into action. In order to do that, you really have to be able to be a consensus builder, to get everybody on the same page, to bring your team to their highest level of performance. But then as the leader, you have to be willing to take that final step and be responsible for that performance. So getting your team to a goal, I think, is important. But um, being able to have that vision and to translate that vision into action is is a real skill that can be honed. Good, good, good. Dr. McCart, you want to chime in on this? Well, sure, I'd love to. And I, some of the words I pulled out of there were responsible, vision, team, action, which is an important part of that, too. Um, well, I want to ask you, Dr. Downard, uh, looking at your research here in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, Pediatric Surgery International, the Journal of Surgical Research, I mean, you are a it seems on the cutting edge of uh, research and medicine. 
um, when you're when you're on the cutting edge like that, it's probably gets to be more of a narrow pool of who to look up to uh, for leadership and mentors. And so this the second question we want to ask you, who do you think best exemplifies your definition of, of leadership? I, th I think you need to be open to different types of leaders for different goals that you want to accomplish. So, you know, in academic medicine, it's usually a tripartite mission of clinical care. And so you want to figure out who's the best at what you want to do clinically, who takes the best care of patients and try to emulate them. Research is the second part usually. And so if, if you know, there you were asking about specifically, if you're looking for the best researchers, they may not be in your area of expertise. They may not be pediatric surgeons. They may not even be surgeons. Um, and then figuring out who the best teachers are, that's usually the third part of the mission. So it is unlikely that one person is going to encompass all of those different missions. And so being open to suggestions from other people as far as how to best accomplish each of those goals, I think is important, especially if you're a developing leader, figuring out how to emulate those um, those different areas. So I, I had different um, individuals, both within the University of Louisville and at other institutions who I looked to for guidance, for inspiration, for a very critical assessment of how I was doing from point to point. And I think that they, being open to the, those suggestions is very important to coming to the next level. I think that's a great point. We talk in our healthcare leadership program about benchmarking and it's, it's similar to what you were saying with, it may not all be in the same area. So to create a, a better healthcare leader will grab quality insights from Toyota. We'll grab uh, financial aspects from some of the best accounting firms out there and strategic vision from uh, maybe some of your other world-class organizations that, that we discover diversity from others. And so it's, uh, I, I think that's a good point. And we, we try to do that um, because it can be hard when you're trying to excel. And you mentioned a three-part approach there that to find uh, many that can, that, that you can emulate. So well, Dr. Owens, what do you, th yeah, please. Go ahead. Add one, one quote that I really like, um, I believe it's, uh, it's, it's, I forget which French philosopher it is, but chance favors the prepared mind. And so I think that specifically in healthcare, if you're looking outside of healthcare, as you said, at, at Toyota process management or uh, whatever whatever financial um, models you want to look at, you really need some alternative solutions a lot of times in healthcare. And I think you really have to look outside of healthcare in order to come up with the best answer sometimes. So you're, you're always looking for a different angle or a different way to do things. So. Thank you. Uh, nice. Dr. Owens, please. Yeah. So, I mean, we kind of alluded to it a little bit in your introduction, but um, could you kind of tell us a little bit about your leadership journey, how it started? When did you know? Were you always going to be a pediatric surgeon? Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your leadership journey. Sure. So um, I think the leadership journey is a little bit different than the pediatric surgery journey. So, <laughs> um, as far as leadership, I've always been a person who is a doer, a finisher, a, a person who was identified as a get the job done kind of person. So whether that was in grade school, high school, college, I was a resident advisor in college. So identified as the leader of the dormitory and, you know, was not shy about telling my hallmates to, to be quiet when they needed to. So um, that continued through medical school and residency. As far as pediatric surgery, um, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from when I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always a singular focus. I never really considered in another career and so was always interested in math and science. Uh, but in college, I majored in French because I figured I'd be doing science for the rest of my life. So I chose something that I was good at and found interesting, but something that would not pigeonhole me into science for the rest of my life if, if that didn't work out for some reason. And then in medical school, I had a pretty open mind as far as the different specialties in medicine. I really enjoyed working with children. I come from a very large family, lots of cousins. And so um, babysitting was, um, was just part of what I did. Mm -hmm. And so but I realized that I really enjoyed being in the operating room and being singularly focused on a task that had defined steps and would come to a resolution. And so coupling that with care for children is how I landed on pediatric surgery. So. 
Okay. So you you kind of you kind of a, a renaissance woman, so to speak. You you started off in French, even though we knew that uh, there was a desire to be in the medical field, and then we caveated that over into some of your, your what. Um, let me ask this question as a caveat: What leadership positions have kind of you had or held throughout your journey to 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 get to where you are now? If you don't mind me asking, I talked about uh, so professionally <laughs> there there have been a few, but. Um, talk about being a resident advisor in college. In medical school, I was the social um, chair of our medical school class. Um, in uh, residency, we had sort of a rotating chief administrative uh, resident who helped to coordinate the rotations and um, call schedules and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so in practice in pediatric surgery, I've been the liaison for our critical care teams. Um, when I when I started here in Louisville, I've been the chair of the American Pediatric Surgical Association Outcomes and Clinical Trials Committee, um, which is currently the um, Outcomes and Ev Evidence-Based Practice Committee. I was the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, Program Committee for the section on surgery, which basically puts together the whole three-day meeting that we have each fall. Um, and then I'm now on the executive committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on surgery. I'm on the program committee of the American College of Surgeons, which is um, a probably 15,000 person meeting every year. We help to coordinate and plan that meeting and choose presentations for that. So I, I like coordinating. I like um, getting buy-in for different ideas. I like exploring different ideas. I like meeting new people. Mm -hmm. So um, each one of those positions, it, that's basically what what has been involved, and it's just a different application of that skill set and knowledge. I think so. Okay, cool, cool, Doctor McCart, what you got? Well, I'd like to ask a follow up question on the leadership journey, and it's really open ended. But as I understand, you grew up in the Louisville area, in in Louisville, and then you have traveled around to some of the the best institutions uh, in the country and beyond here to to learn and gather information. And that's one thing that we well, we had a call last week talking to the Greater Louisville Inc. about how to keep the talent, retain the talent we have here, how to attract more talent in terms of business and, and individuals. Um, so my question is a, a follow up on your leadership journey. Did you always know you wanted to come back to Louisville or um, were you just kind of out there uh, exploring or can you tell us about that? I'm laughing because Dr. Owens and I um, had a brief um, talk about that before we started <laughs> the recording. I left Louisville at 18 and swore I was never coming back. So, and as, as sort of strange as it sounds now, I think the internet has been very helpful for realizing the global, the globalization of mm -hmm. just, just the world and, and opening Louisville up to the rest of the world. So um, I, I left Louisville, went not very far to Nashville to Vanderbilt for undergraduate and then stayed there for medical school. And then after that, I wanted to move as far away as I could. So I moved to Oregon for residency, um, mm -hmm. which I loved. My mother was not very excited about it. <laughs> Um, then moved to Boston for a few years, did research there and got a master's degree and then back out to Oregon and to Atlanta for my pediatric surgery fellowship. At that point, I had um, gotten married, had two children and um, being close to family was definitely more important to me at that point. Uh, the other thing too is, is the University of Louisville and Norton Children's Hospital really was the best job for me. Um, you know, as you look at different uh, jobs, you want to make sure that you've got a good mix of people, good mix of ideas, good mix of seniority. And it was it was going to be the best fit for me overall. And that's been the case. And so I've been here for almost 14 years now. OK, well, we are sure glad you're here in this community. Um, well, our next question here, I want to uh, I mean, we have a healthcare leadership program and we're developing organizational leaders. And could you give us three traits that you think up and comers uh, need to have to be leaders in the medical field in, in 2021 and beyond and, and even outside the medical field? Sure. I think that um, specific to the medical field, um, definitely important in all areas, but specific to the medical field, you really have to have situational awareness and emotional intelligence. I think those are very closely combined. So um, people, when they come to a, a medical situation, are usually at their most vulnerable. And figuring out how to address concerns, or especially if it's your you know, we're in a situation where your child has either been injured or needs surgery and inspiring that confidence so that a parent feels comfortable with you uh, making life and death decisions with them about their child is, is critical to establish a rapport. And without 
the emotional intelligence to be aware of the fact that they're coming from that situation, I think you can really, um, really struggle in that, in that situation. So, so that's one, um, I guess I'd sort of put those together. I think communication and being a, a good communicator and just being very upfront and clear and not, I, I'm not a sugar coater kind of person at all. And I think that that's very, very important when, again, you're trying to make life and death decisions for families and their children. And then being open to other ideas, not um, not just married to one idea, and this is my way or the highway, being um, open to suggestions, to alternate strategies, to um, to honor others who are helping you to make those decisions, I think is, is also important. So. Oh, those are... I think those are uh, very wide and, and timeless leadership principles there. And um, I would like to read. So in, in academia, we've got to rate my professor and um, you all have something called health grades. And I would like to just read a quick quote that we found in my research um, just to, to sort of uh, show that you're, you're walking the walk out there. And so this quote was five stars. It was on, it was on Dr. Downard, five stars. She saved my son's life, wonderful bedside manner and just an excellent physician. So I wanted to be sure that I shared that with the audience. Thanks. And uh, yeah, that's- uh, I try not to go look at that because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I don't yeah. read your book your reviews, you know, so. And that wonderful bedside manner is, uh, I think that goes a long way in what you're talking about, the communication, the emotional intelligence, because sometimes a, a gifted physician or a gifted leader, or a gifted scientist, um, it's a little hard to have both sides of the brain firing <laughs> in, a, in a way, but that logical aspects and the communication piece too. So. Uh, just wanted to give a quote from the internet about you and and, and let our audience know. Uh, Dr. Owens, let me hand it back to you. Yeah. So let me, I mean, obviously our, our listening audience is, is understanding that Dr. Downard is well-traveled. She is, 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 she started off in Louisville and she said she'd never come back by, by way of Nashville, right? She went to Vanderbilt and anchored down, right? Then she left Nashville, went all the way to the West coast to Oregon, right? Became a flying duck. Right. I think or the Oregon Ducks. I don't know if it's a flying duck, but it's a duck. <laughs> and then she just mentioned that I think if I if I read your um, your CV correct, your resume correct, you, it was down at Emory in Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so she is well traveled. She's well known. So let me ask you this as we segue a little bit away from leadership and kind of get into the, the next uh, topic we talk about is organizational learning. Um, so as a surgeon, um, is it important to know your learning style? And I asked that question because, you know, um, before I got full time into to being a, a teacher, I was full time in being a college football coach. And I knew how critical it was that in order for my teams or, or my unit to perform well, I kind of had to know everybody's learning style in order to make practice more efficient in order to make the games you know obviously our outcomes work the way they needed to to work um and so just from obviously i have no medical experience this is a question just off curiosity you know as a surgeon which you are um is it important to know your learning style absolutely i, I mean i think that medical students as you go through your third and fourth year clinical rotations so the way medical school set up is your generally in the classroom the first two years of medical school, of course, not right now with COVID, but um, but more book learning, studying, test taking, things like that. And then the third and fourth year are clinical rotations where you're in the hospital, in the clinic, seeing patients, um, applying what you've learned in those first two years. So I think the first two years are sort of like learning a foreign language and understanding how the human body works. And then the third and fourth year are more applying that knowledge. As far as learning styles, though, I think that you migrate a little bit to different specialties based on your learning style. So certainly if you're not somebody who's interested in doing anything with your hands, surgery is probably not going to be the field for you. Um, but understanding how to engage everyone. So we have medical students who are never going to be inside an operating room ever again. We need to make sure that they get the best out of their rotation and understand what they need to know about surgery, taking care of surgical patients, how people recover from the insults of, a, of an operation. Um, and so reaching each person where they are is very important to understand the learning styles. So, um, you know, and I, I think that self-awareness too is important of your own, your own learning style so that you recognize what keeps you engaged, how you uh, can assimilate that knowledge best and then apply it in a real world situation. That's great. I got some great nuggets from that. Thanks. Dr. McCart, what do you have? 
So um, thank you for that, Dr. Downard. And, and I just wanted to say in your travels, you mentioned you went out to Boston. Um, you didn't say where you studied or, or what you did out there, but uh, I believe I saw in your bio, you got a master's degree at, at Harvard. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. Uh, I just wanted to point, point that out for our audience. And, um, so we didn't blow past that. That's uh, certainly a great credential, again, to have in our, in our area. Um, well, so at the University of Louisville, we have something called the Center for Digital Transformation. And it is, we're working with, with that center to embed tools uh, from there, such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, data analysis, deep learning, these things that um, have gone from buzzwords to being implemented in, in various fields. And I want to ask you some of the tools that the medical field is using, and it, it could be related to those digital and computing tools or or other tools, um, whether they're more more analog and more about the uh, the practice. But what, what kind of tools are you all using to to help get better as doctors and surgeons? So that impacts every aspect of medicine. So over the last 10 years, we've seen a broad implementation of electronic medical records and the ability to mine data from the electronic medical record, whether it's the actual patient information, how long physicians are in the charts for, how long it takes you to see a patient, how many patients you can schedule in a day, that is all available, which was not easily captured before. Um, mm -hmm. On the clinical side of things, simulation is just a huge part of medicine, especially if, as you look at um, remote learning and distance learning um, opportunities, simulation becomes more and more important if you don't have as much hands-on experience. And so um, we see that definitely with um, advanced cardiac life support courses where, you know, the, the mannequins now can tell you whether your chest compressions were sufficiently deep. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, they blink in everything. It's, it's very realistic. And so those simulations are, are very important. Um, and in, in surgery, we actually have um, high fidelity and low fidelity simulators as well to, to learn how to do procedures, learn how to do laparoscopic and robotic procedures. And so um, artificial intelligence, as you said, is, is coming into part of that. There are now structured observations, and there's been a lot of research in um, in laparoscopic surgery, especially because a lot of times it's on a TV screen and can be recorded or evaluated remotely. And so there's a big study in Michigan a few years ago looking at um, bariatric surgery and outcomes and how that relates to how people rate your surgical skills. And so, um, you know, we're not at a point now where that's part of the credentialing or anything, but it, it's something that that could for, be part of the foreseeable future. So, Well, it seems like the trend, yeah, absolutely. The trend's going in that direction. And uh, just as we were talking about benchmarking earlier, Dr. Owens, I think we could uh, learn some things about how they're teaching and learning over there and bring them back to our, our leadership classroom. So, 1000 percent we're all styles percent i mean sure i mentioned about cross you know like when you when you're looking at a leadership sometimes you got to look outside of your model to go find what you're looking for to to help you know progress the next whoever hr person uh organizational leader ceo ceo so you're 1000 percent correct is what we can use bring something from the medical field over into to just regular organizational leadership and learning mm -hmm. well let me hand it to you for our next question dr owens Sure. So let me ask you this. Um, this is, a, I, I don't know. I mean, we were just kind of talking about bringing things over. So um, being a medical professional and a leader, what are three things you wish uh, a new employee, a new medical student, someone coming straight from med school um, that's green or a rookie, you know, as they head into the workplace, as they head into the medical field, you know, what are three things that you think are, are critical that you wish they... Um, that you wish they knew they knew because they don't know, even though they think they know. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you though. <laughs> so I, I alluded to some of it before. I think that um, the recognition that medicine is just hard. You mm -hmm. know, you're at, you're at a point where people are at their most vulnerable. You're trying to help them through this process. And um, you, you have to be able to deal with that. And I think that mm -hmm. a lot of people get, you know, for instance, myself, third grade, I was going to be a physician and I did not waver from that one bit. I think a lot of people are in that situation. There are certainly people who come to medical school a little bit later after another career, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people that are straight out of college, straight into medical school, have never seen or thought of anything else. And you get to the third and fourth year of medical school and you realize this is 
this is really challenging, <laughs> not just from a, a amount of information, because first and second year of medical school, the amount of information that you have to assimilate is is like nothing I have ever experienced. Um, but third and fourth year dealing with the, the human interaction and those aspects is it's just really hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, making sure that we have resources available for that, I think is, is more and more discussed now. But you, in times past, it was, you just need to, to be tough and you'll get through it. But I think the recognition and you talk about physician burnout and suicide rates being um, sky high compared to other individuals, that recognition is is there. So, so that's, um, that's at least a step in the right direction, I think. Um, I think, and I alluded to this before as well, that everybody really just wants the, the best for their self or their family member. Um, they don't come to a situation looking to um, attack you. They really, it's, it, if something like that happens, it's because they come from a place of concern for themselves or, or their family member. And I think right. we need to recognize that is very important. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, one thing that I was taught in medical school is that having a plan uh, when you talk to someone about a really tough situation is very important. So for instance, when I was a third year medical student, one of my residents, uh, we got a report back from the pathology lab saying that, that a patient had cancer. And I said, oh, you know, we got to go tell him. And he said, we need a plan first. We need to talk to the oncologist. We need to know what the next steps are, because if we walk in there and tell Mr. Jones that he has cancer, he's not going to hear anything else. We need to then hand him a piece of paper that says, in your appointment with the oncologist is this. You're going to get started on chemotherapy that. You're going to have surgery on this date. You need a plan in place. And so I always try to, um, to make sure that that is the case. And, you know, if I have a, a suspicion that, um, that a pathology report is going to be bad news. I'll try and prepare people ahead of time. But then I tell them, I'm going to call you with this as soon as I know, because I know if I were in that situation, you know, people talk about whether you should give bad news in person or by, by phone, I would want to know right away. And I would want to know the next thing, what is the plan? And so I think right. that having a plan in place is, is critical. But man, those are great points that I think even in no matter what your field is, whether you go into medical or whether you go into um, wherever you want to go, whatever industry you want to go into, one, know that it's hard. It's not going to be easy to um, obviously people come to you because they want the best. I think um, people want to be treated well. And then three, obviously, just have a plan, because if you don't have a plan, I think what's the old saying? Uh, if you don't have a if you fail to plan, plan. If, there you go. You stole the word right out of my mouth. I, I always get it twisted in my head before it comes out of my mouth and it never comes out right. Let me uh, give a shout out to our program real quick. Learning takes place in great learning environments and University of Louisville is one of those great environments. Come challenge yourself to lead with compassion and expertise in a changing world and learn from award winning faculty such as Dr. Downer uh, and lead <laughs> the award-winning faculty in a nationally recognized program that specializes in leadership and learning. Check out our bachelor's and master's degree programs at U of L dot me backslash podcast dash O L L. Um, let me segue into our, our last point or not our last point, but we always want to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about things um, that we feel are near and dear to what our listeners are listening to, as well as things that are near and dear to you. Uh, one thing I want to talk about a little bit is about women in medicine. Um, and reading your bio, I noticed that you kind of, um, I believe when you were at Norton, there was a, a, a female surgeon prior to you, if, I'm, if I read that correct. So you kind of took over after another woman in leadership, which is a great thing. But um, can you tell some of our listeners the challenges of being um, a woman in medicine and kind of leading the way at this point in time? Sure. I think that it's a unique time for women in medicine because uh, my predecessor, Dr. Mary Fallett, she was the surgeon in chief at Norton Children's Hospital for 18 years before me. And in um, her generation and, you know, Dr. Karen Devaney, who was my program director in general surgery, they really were in a situation, especially in surgery, where they were a lot of times the only woman in their definitely residency class, if not their whole wow. surgery residency program. And I mean, that's like 50 people, they would be the only one. Mm -hmm. So the, the generation ahead of me uh, really, were the trailblazers, particularly in surgery. When I graduated from medical school, we were 50-50 gender um, mixed in medical school. So had come a long way since the 70s and 80s in that, in that regard. I do think though now the recognition of implicit bias 
and um, micro and macro regressions in medicine, um, you know, both based on gender and um, ethnic and racial diversity. It's it has a name now, and it's something that we have experienced for our entire lives and entire careers. But the fact that it has a name and is actively being addressed, mm -hmm. this is a really opportune time to uh, to be a woman in medicine. So. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that information. That, that's unique. That's very unique. I, I wasn't aware of that. I, I knew that um, in medicine, it seemed like with medicine kind of had always been a pioneer with women in leadership, whether it be from nursing or doctors. But I, I wasn't aware of the vast um, disparity. And like you said, it has a name now. Dr. McCart? Well, yeah, thank you for sharing those statistics. And again, something that is trending in the right direction. Certainly a lot of work to do, but um, glad to see those numbers are, are closer to 50-50. What you said. Uh, so I want to ask you another question on uh, the topic of women in medicine. And are there skills, traits, or experience that you would suggest to a young lady uh, who will be heading into the medical field, or um, even things that could relate to uh, women in leadership, whether in the medical field or other fields? Yeah, I think um, the issues of skills or traits and experiences and such are not necessarily gender specific for medicine. I think the recognition that um, anybody going into medicine really needs to be outward focused, again, re recognizing that you are meeting people at their most vulnerable time of their life. You really need to be self-motivated too, because at midnight, you know, there's not going to be anybody standing over your shoulder, making sure that you've looked up the the latest information on whatever treatment you're about to um, impart to a patient. And so you need to be motivated from within that that you're going to do the best for your for your patients. And you have to be willing to do the work. Um, you know, I, I recognize my first semester of medical school, I was a hardcore studier in, in college, you know, would always get my work done before going out to um, hang out with my friends and things like that. I was studying every night in medical school, first semester till 10 p.m. I mean, nose in the books and was just not not making it. So I recognized I need to study harder. I needed to stay up that extra hour or two hours to to put the time and the work in. Mm -hmm. And it made a night night and day difference for me personally, but you really have to be willing to um, to dedicate um, that time and effort. And, and, th and that's um, not specific to medicine, but it's definitely part of medicine. People talk about, you know, you go to medical school, and you never see your, your friends from college and such. Um, there's a reason for that, because at midnight on Saturday night, you are studying. You are not out at the bars having a great time with all of your friends. Well, nobody is, hopefully, COVID <laughs> but um, but it, it really is a, um, a um, vocation, not so much a career, but a vocation that you're called to do. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a follow-up question a little bit off of our script here, but you mentioned in an earlier response about avoiding burnout, and and I can imagine in, in your profession, and I heard a story of a, a surgeon just in the last week that was trying to schedule something on Sunday night because the, the rest of the week the schedule is full. And so how do you how do you draw boundaries and find that balance to to travel and play tennis and, and go to the food scene and enjoy the things that we all love to do? Um, and still raise to the ranks of, um, you know, of high level um, groundbreaking research. So I hope my question made sense there. How do you find the balance between burnout and excelling? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's a little bit different for everyone. Um, and medicine is, is a little odd too, because you really don't start your career where you have the opportunity to make a lot of choices until you're usually in your early to mid thirties. And so it's this process where you are looking to get into college, you know, and, and sort of asking, you know, applying, please accept me for your college. And then you're asking and, and, um, you know, applying to get into medical school. And then you're interviewing for residency, but that again is through what's called the match where they tell you where you're going for your residency. You get to choose what specialty you want to be in, but then, but you sign a contract saying wherever the match tells me I'm going, I'm moving there. And so I, I opened my letter and it said, you're moving to Oregon. I said, oh, I'm moving to Oregon. So, um, so that's, that's all a process where you're um, really not in control of your own situation too much. In the meantime, you're taking on just hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, of educational debt. And so once you get to um, your job, when you're actually interviewing for your first position outside of residency, 
um, it is a really weird switch to recognize that you're in the driver's seat. Um, not only where you want to live, what your job is going to look like, what your income is going to look like. And I think um, that's really challenging for a lot of physicians because you've never really been in that situation before. And so it's it, if I um, have the opportunity to advise folks who are in that situation. So I'm the, the program director of our pediatric surgery training program. And so that means that the individuals who are pediatric surgery fellows are usually about 10 years out of medical school getting their first real job and um, helping them to realize that they have to take an active part in controlling their own narrative and what their uh, position is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and the more that you can make your life look like what you want it to look like, you know, I, I want to work X number of hours a week. I um, And realizing that there is a, a pay differential that comes with um, with working more and taking care of um, more patients and doing more procedures and such, um, figuring out what that balance is for you and feeling like you're in control of that situation, I think more and more um, decreases the likelihood of burnout. So, But it's, mm -hmm. it's a challenge for sure, because especially as physicians are more and more in employed situations where there's a pressure to, to be more clinically productive. You may not have the, um, and you have student loans hanging over your head. There may be uh, more challenges to take a step back and say, hey, I need some time for myself. I really need to make sure that my own personal wellness is, is part of this process as well. So, Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And I imagine it would be hard to to say no to an hour of work when it could, the revenue that it could bring into the individual and to the organization. So, well, that's, uh, I think that's a great point to realize who's in the driver's seat now after, <laughs> after jumping through hoops for really for many, many years. So, well, Dr. Owens, let me hand it back over to you for the next question. Yeah, it's real simple. Um, obviously, we've seen a rise of, of, of I don't want to say women in power because that makes me seem like I'm I'm not respecting it. But we have seen, you know, what I mean, like I we understand that it, 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 it's just happening. And so, um, you know, what do you see, Dr. Downard, um, happening in organizations as a result of women landing some some pretty high ranking positions such as yourself? Uh, we just saw, you know, in, in, our, in our nation, you know, our, our the first woman uh, vice president. Um, and so how do you think that's changing the world or companies, organization, organizations view of diversity for women, uh, policies that maybe we need to really look at and address and change, you know, moving forward? I think that the um, again, back to the issue of implicit bias, I think it's just recognized because mm -hmm. for um, for women and for um, whatever field is has the uh, whatever minority is underrepresented in that field, that recognition and then being very intentional about addressing both the biases and recruitment processes. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just part of, of how things um, are done and will be done. Uh, the other thing I think that that women do um, a little bit differently in general is build consensus differently. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, some opportunities there, I think, from a leadership standpoint. I think a fantastic example example of a, a woman who is just an outstanding leader all the way around is Dr. Ben Dapudi. Mm -hmm. She has just uh, changed the game as far as coming into a very, very challenging situation and um, taking a read of the university and making some pretty drastic changes. Um, what normally would be considered fairly quickly, but they, they were just necessary. She is just unbelievable as far as her transparency, um, consensus building, but again, willing to make that final step and, and take responsibility for what ultimately mm -hmm. happens. So that's an amazing answer. Dr. McCart. I'm glad you mentioned president Ben Dapudi. We had an opportunity to speak with her and, um, we say this sometimes, but we have a, a strong line of, of leaders, um, who happen to be, uh, women here in our department chair, Dr. Sharon Carrick is a, a wonderful leader, uh, Dean a Amy Lingo at the College of Education and Human Development, and um, President Ben Dapudi. So mm -hmm. it is. I, the, the consensus building is is differently, and uh, there, there's a lot of great things about it. I'm, I'm glad to see more of it and, and hope to continue to see uh, more female leadership. So well, why don't we pivot to our next section here with a, a question and change gears. Um, I want to ask about pediatric trauma and safety, one of your specialties and something we can all learn about. And Dr. Owens mentioned I'm going to be a future parent. We're expecting next month. So uh, that's uh, 
Uh, I'm going to be calling him a lot, and I may even uh, send you a message, Dr. Brown, for some advice. But uh, in all seriousness, here's our next question. Um, with pediatric trauma being the number one killer of children in America, what are some things around that topic that we need to be aware of and that the, the community and society needs to, to look at differently? So a, a lot of um, pediatric trauma is preventable. And I think that that's the important thing to recognize, mm -hmm. um, whether it's having your infant in the proper restraint device in the, in the car. Um, we see a lot of children who come in who are buckled into their car seat, but the car seat's not buckled into the car. Um, it seems pretty basic, but the one time that you don't do that is the one time that you're going to end up on the highway at 70 miles an hour flipping the car. And mm -hmm. so um, the, the times that, that we can intervene ahead of time and be proactive really will be the best way to decrease pediatric, um, pediatric trauma. And I, I need to... Um, Recognize to my colleague, Dr. David Foley, he is the um, director of our trauma program at Norton Children's Hospital, and he has done just a tremendous amount of work with um, public health interventions and partnering with, um, with our emergency department physicians, uh, with the hospital, and really just getting the word out as far as um, community awareness of these issues. So, hmm. Well, thank you for that answer. And uh... As luck would have it, we're, my wife and I are going this afternoon to get our car seat inspected, so it's it's in there just right. I, every time. You got to do it every I, time. <laughs> I, I was the one that installed it, and I thought we better get a double check on it because I, uh, my, uh, I, I'm i not the handiest person. I'm more of a caller. So. <laughs> then you get the kids, you know, who are 8 and 10 years old who, um, and my children were just embarrassed, but they need to sit in a booster seat and they give you very specific weight guidelines and height guidelines at which you're okay to be out of the booster seat. But, you know, seatbelts are not made for children. They're made for adults. And so if you have a child who's not in a booster seat, who's, who's too small for that situation and you're in a car accident, that, that um, seatbelt comes right across their mid abdomen and causes intestinal injury and spine injuries and things like that. It's, it's all preventable. It's not fun. And when you're arguing with your 10 year old about getting in their booster seat, None of their other friends have to do that, um, but you know when when you see the um, the devastation that can happen as a result of not following those rules every time, it's mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to be um, to be the bad parent, <laughs> the mean parent, I should say, not bad parent, good parent. <laughs> Mean parent. Well, that's, uh, I'm a student of public health, and so that's so many of the gains that we've had in uh, life expectancy and. Prevent these things that are preventable are from these policies instituted from a public health perspective. So mm -hmm. I can appreciate that answer. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Owens? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Dr. McCarr, you alluded to it. I mean, and, and Dr. Downer, you, you're, you're a mom as well. We, we're all parents in this situation. And obviously you have a better, much better insight, I think, than, than or at least than I do. Um, Dr. McCarr um, is in the healthcare leadership field, and I am totally outside of the the medical profession. So just as a parent, you've alluded to it a little bit as far as the booster seat and following the guidelines, but what do parents need to be aware of be aware of as it relates to pediatric trauma and safety? Because again, the last question said it's the number one killer of children in America. So there's obviously a lot going on in the community that maybe we're not aware of, or that doesn't make the news. Uh, maybe it's, it's just not quote unquote newsworthy. It's, it's not the sexy story, but obviously as parents, future and current, what do we need to be aware of? Mm -hmm. So one thing that has made the news, unfortunately, recently is the um, high number of firearm injuries we've had in children, specifically through 2020, we had over 50 firearm injuries in children, which was more than double any other year that we've had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, stories from uh, leaving guns in, uh, number one, leaving them loaded and unlocked in a house, um, having a, a gun in your pocket, you know, that, that you think that children don't see, um, having it hidden in the, um, the closet in your bedroom. Children are very curious and they will go find a gun, especially if it's loaded and they, they don't understand that it's not a toy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number of siblings who've, um, who shot their sibling, 
it, it is it is just devastating. And the issue really is that um, number one, a lot of it is preventable. If you had the guns locked or at least unloaded or a gun lock, um, there was a story on WDRB last week about this very um, topic. The the university hospital down the street too has just seen a huge number of firearm injuries. I think they had a, over 150 um, firearm injuries in in uh, teens under 18 years of age. And then, you know, we have the younger children at, at the children's hospital, but um, whether it's, um, and at the end of that story, they talked about a number to contact to um, obtain a gun lock for your gun, but that is um, largely preventable. And it is a situation where when those children come to the hospital, the damage has been done and we are trying to, um, to catch up and it's, it's not always a survivable injury. And so, um, just education in the community about how to safely store guns, how to be a responsible gun owner. And, um, you know, nobody wants to see their children shot and mm -hmm. especially die. And it, it is really um, a devastating uh, problem that we have in our community right now. Yeah, thanks for bringing some some insight to that because I, I I don't think that's always we're always aware of that. You know, what I mean, I think we're aware of what makes the news and we kind of think that's it. But you alluded to like booster seats and seat belts, you know, not being made for uh, children, being made primarily for adults. Um, I, I don't, and I, and I know just being for myself, the way I was raised, like that, those weren't conversations we had in the household growing up. It was. More like, you know, why, am I ha why do I have to wear this seatbelt? But I don't know if, if if all the measures were followed, you know, like they should have been. Thank God I was, you know, we were never, me or my siblings were never in any injuries or, or car accidents. But, um, man, that's that gives me something to think about. Um, Dr. McCart, what do you have? Well, just quickly on that topic, my father uh, was a state policeman for the whole time I was growing up. So we had guns around the house, but it was very much... Uh, 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 we were, he talked about it, there was safety and there are safe ways. And I know this isn't a political statement. It's more of a safety conversation that we're having here. And so right. there are ways to have guns safely. And we've talked about technology and all the great advances we've seen in technology. The same thing goes around gun safety. If someone wants to have them, there's, there's digital locks that scan your fingerprints to open them up. And so uh, I think there's really no excuse to, to, not having those safety measures in place. So I appreciate you bringing that up as a public health matter. And um, so uh, is there anything else on that topic of pediatric trauma and safety or should we, uh, anything else Dr. Downer, do you like to say on, on safety or should we move to our next topic? Well, one other thing, if you look at the, um, and this is about firearm safety. So, you know, we see the smaller children with, um, with issues of, of gun storage and things like that. But the other, um, uh, travesty that we see is teenagers who have access to firearms and um, suicide is a, is a big killer in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, a teen suicide um, by firearm injury. And so, um, you know, I recently had a conversation with a friend about whether their um, teenagers were old enough to have the passcode to their, um, to their gun safe. And I so say you need you need to watch out because if you look at the Kentucky um, Vital Statistics Registry, it is alarming the number of uh, teenagers who die by firearm um, injury each year. So hmm. think think twice. Do you mind if I ask one more one quick question? Just just uh, as a as a novice in the healthcare field, uh, I know Dr. McCart may know this answer, and obviously Dr. Downer, I'm sure you do. But what ages? When we say pediatric, I know we're talking typically young children or, or young adults. I guess I'm not sure. At what are the ages that pediatric does cover? Or pediatrics um, as a profession, what ages that cover? What ages does that cover? Usually goes up to age 18. Um, we do see um, young adults who are over 18 who are still being seen by their pediatrician. A lot of pediatricians will continue to see um, young adults until they've graduated from college. So sometimes we'll have patients who are 19, 20, but usually 18 is um, is when folks will uh, transition to adult healthcare providers by and large. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, why don't we... Um... We transition. We like to have a little fun here, and I'm—I've uh, never been accused of being the fun one between Dr. Owens and I. So I think I better hand it back to him. But we—we we like to uh, ask you some fun questions, and, and hopefully let the audience get to know you a little bit outside of your professional uh, persona. All right. I don't know if Dr. McCart is not the fun one. He really makes me. I, I mean, there was a 
I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. There was a text message sent out this weekend that says, I don't laugh at his jokes, but Dr. McCart is actually the hilarious one out of the two of us. <laughs> he, he definitely keeps me on my toes and makes me laugh quite a bit. Um, but let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to go back. We're going to travel. We're going to take today. We're going to travel back in time a little bit because I actually think we can a- we can answer ask a couple of fun questions today. But if Doctor Downer could go back and tell the 13 year old Cindy, if she could give her any wise advice, any counsel, any uh, whatever, um, what would it be? That's a that's a good question. I'd probably um, put a few more hours in on the tennis court at that age. <laughs> I'd like to be a little better tennis player than I am, and I think that that's really the opportunity that you have. Of uh, you know, academics were not um, not an issue, so I I had no problem putting extra hours in studying and such. But mm-hmm. um, and it's interesting because I have two daughters, um, and so when you're talking about what would you tell thirteen year old Cindy, I'm telling. 16 and 18 year olds and they, you know, things that I would do differently or do the same. So especially as one's getting ready to head to college this fall. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do think that um, developing lifelong um, skills in a, um, you know, exercise and health and well-being is very important. And that's really when it's developed. And so, um, again, studying hard was was not a question. I knew that that was expected, but the um, the other stuff um, Mm -hmm. As far as eating well, exercising is going to um, serve you well long term, life wise. So that's probably what I would tell my 13 year old self to get it together. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, this question is has been the stumper, right? This question has has stumped and stumbled every uh, most of our guests, which is why I keep it in the queue. And this question is this If your life was the title of a book, made up or real, what would it be and why? So um, if I were writing a book, I'm not super creative and I, I recognize that. So it'd probably be like a how to leadership, networking, whatever um, book. And so I think that um, one piece of advice that I really consistently give when people say, how do I get to, you know, wherever you're, whatever you're doing, um, you know, I'm interested in following your footsteps, whatever. Two things are very important. So I think this would probably be the title of the book would be show up mm-hmm. and do the work. So that those two pieces of advice seem so basic, but the farther along I get in my career, the fewer the number of people who will a show up. And it's, it's easier now with virtual conferences and meetings and things like that. I mean, the number of people who actually do log in and show up for a meeting has just gone up exponentially since they're virtual. Mm -hmm. Um, taking the time off of work, whether it was national meetings or, um, you know, making it to a meeting in the afternoon, if you had a full day in the OR, it's always really a challenge, but being able to do that virtually. So that's half of the battle is just showing up. And actually, if you say you're going to be there, be there. And then during those meetings, work is generated that needs to be done. And it's not, you know, we're going to show up to the meeting and then talk about how the stuff didn't get done that we talked about last time. You got to actually do stuff in between the meetings. And so doing the work, volunteering, put your name on it and then finish it and come back to that next meeting and say, Hey, I finished X that we talked about, but I also did Y and Z. And what do you think about going to A, B and C? That is the easiest way to be recognized for what you're doing. And people very quickly say, Oh, that person gets stuff done. I want them to be at the forefront of whatever our next project is. And so I think that that's not healthcare specific. That's, that's life specific so man that is phenomenal that's it that's that's the nugget right there that's the golden nugget (laughs) one show up two do the work so don't be lazy and show up and i would say probably be enthused when you show up act like you want to be there by the way (laughs) dr mccart what do you have well that goes along with i've got a a three-step methodology for success i tell my students and it is uh go to work stay at work and work at work (laughs) <laughs> and just be amazed at how, how your opportunities will open up for you when you do those things. So, um, well, you had mentioned, uh, and we, we saw in our research here that you enjoyed traveling, uh, playing tennis, being out at, uh, go, going to the food scene here in Louisville, which is uh, really a culinary town. And so my wife is a, a great cook, but when it's my turn, I make what I make best, which is reservations. So I, I may see you out in the city <laughs> sometime. Um, but as far as traveling, where for one, how do you how do you make time for that, and 
uh, how does it help you come back feeling recharged and excited to take on the challenges and see them in a different way? Mm -hmm. So I, I, there are a couple different ways to look at that. One is that um, in this, my first year of residency, I, I when you talk about um, getting into medicine, what, what do you wish you would have known? And saying it's it's just hard. I I called my mother and I said this is just hard. And she said, well, well, what do you want to do? I said I really love to travel. And she said, well, you need to figure out a way to put that all together so that the hard work that you're doing results in travel. And that's research actually comes into that because a lot of research, um, and this is true outside of medicine as well, you present at national meetings and you travel to go to those meetings. So for a long time, that was um, a, an added bonus of, I'm going to do this project and then I'm going to tell all my friends about it at the next meeting and, and um, colleagues. So work travel has been um, important to me. And that's also part of showing up for the meetings and such. I've, I've made that a priority. That obviously is not happening as much um, in the COVID era. But um, leisure travel really has been and learning about new cultures and environments um, has been a big part of, um, of what I've done and what I really enjoy doing. That has been a real challenge over the last year. Um, I am a person who if, if I'm at a meeting where I know absolutely no one um, and you put me in a cocktail party, like that is my deal. So I love networking. I love meeting new people. I love hearing people's stories mm -hmm. and figuring out, um, again, keeping an open mind and saying, how can I apply this, you know, their area of expertise to what I'm looking at um, really is just unique opportunities. And that has been lost a lot, I think, virtually. So um so I think that figuring out how to um, incorporate that travel or whatever it is that helps you recharge um, into your daily activities and um, something that's going to help you uh, career-wise, if you can if you can put it all together, then that's really a, a fantastic solution. So that's I think that's a great point. And, uh, you mentioned um, the research on kind of creating habits and the research on rewarding yourself. And that's, that's something that we, you didn't mention that exactly, but um, something that we read and study and that idea of having kind of a, uh, a carrot at the end of the stick so that you can work toward that, that fun and, and envision yourself uh, sharing those uh, stories and sharing the, the fruits of your labor at conferences. So, well, Dr. Owens, why don't I, uh, I hand it over to you and I, I feel pretty complete. I've learned more in the last hour than, than I did all, uh, the last time I can remember. So I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, Dr. Dowder, we just, you know, want to give you the opportunity to just to kind of share some of your wise counsel. You know, um, I don't like using the word advice because I don't think we add any vices to anybody. I think we use wise counsel. Uh, we can add wise counsel to anybody, uh, black, white, purple, green, or yellow, male or female. Um, and so moving forward, we've been through a crazy 2020 with COVID. Um, we're moving forward into 2021. We see the vaccine out there. We see, you know, we have a woman vice president. As people listening to this podcast will see that we have, you know, women in leaderships in pediatric surgery and other realms throughout the world. So what wise counsel would you give or shout on the mountaintops, just kind of wanting people to know as they enter into the medical field um, in 2021? I think um, recognizing your value is important. Um, it is a, a system that you need to be part of, but also recognizing that you have something unique that you bring. Um, and this is for women, men, purple, yellow, as you said, whoever, um, recognizing that you have a unique perspective to bring to people and to contribute to their health care. Um, I also think that um, recognizing that there are a lot of opportunities that, um, you know, and this is true in, in um, not just in medicine, but positions that may not even exist yet. And to be open to those um, opportunities as they come along and figuring out how to adapt, how to learn, how to um, move through those different situations, I think is, is important. And so whether it's medicine or business or teaching, whatever the, the area is, I think that learning how to learn is um, even more important now than, um, than it has been in the past. And so that's, you know, when I, when I talk to my um, teenage daughters about that and making sure that they are in um, a situation where that is being optimized, I think is, is really important. Yeah, that's great. Dr. McCarty, you think for the, for, for Dr. Downard as we, we part ways with her today? I just want to say thank you for your, uh, just for your time and being so generous with the, the knowledge and information. I, uh, the 
the things that you told us here of the communication, the emotional intelligence, situational awareness, um, all the advice for uh, working hard and um, really making the world a better place through your work. I, I'll just, I'm going to come away from this conversation inspired and uh, I look forward to implementing some of the things we've learned here. So just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a guest. I appreciate it, Dr. McCart and Dr. Owens. Well, thank you, Dr. Downard. Keep leading. We know you're doing a phenomenal job. Keep making the way. The medical field is in great hands. Pediatrics is in great hands. Surgery is in great hands. Uh, with you leading the helm in the city of Louisville, we trust you. And thank you with from the bottom of our heart for being a guest on the Cardinal Call podcast today. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, Dr. McCart. Uh, can't say enough about Dr. Cindy Downer. She is doing a phenomenal work. She's doing some great things. She gave us some great nuggets. The biggest nugget from my takeaway of all this is, is one show up to do the work. What about you? What do you think? Well, I, I'm just looking at my notes here and um, things about your learning style. And mm -hmm. I mean, there were just a number of things that came up, but understanding how you learn and, and understanding how other people on the team learn and working to, use the best practices and technology, even if it's not from uh, what's right in front of you, but go out there and find it and find ways to, to help your team grow and, and be better. Um, this, you know, this uh, addressing uh, bias in the recruitment process as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, the attributes that women bring to the workplace that uh, are so valuable, we need to continue to promote that. And, and what we can learn as men in leadership uh, from that, building consensus and communicate, and then ultimately stepping up and taking responsibility. I, I just I learned a lot, and uh, I could I could go on here, but I think that's uh, those are a few things for me to work on for for this month anyway. No doubt, no doubt. Let's give our last shout out to our program here. The OLO program at the University of Louisville fosters leadership, learning, and performance to provide relevant solutions to a changing world. We offer programs at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels. Our program educates professionals who focus on leadership, organizational development, human resources, and workforce development in order to benefit individuals, organizations, and society as a whole. To learn more information, check us out at uofl.me backslash E-L-E-O-D dash O-L-L. I can't say enough. I mean, I think everything you hit on was perfect. I think it summarizes this whole interview. Um, 100% knowing your learning style, knowing how to lead um, and doing it with integrity, doing it and understanding that, you know, the world is changing and having an open mind when that happens. Um, what are your final thoughts? Uh, some final thoughts, I think, are just um, and this goes for for you and I, but um, looking back at this idea of, of having a podcast and interviewing leaders around the city and the region and beyond. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's a quote I like from Napoleon Hill. He says, the, the oak sleeps in the acorn, and uh, it, it starts with a dream and, and an idea. And so you and I just talked about it. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice to do a podcast and learn some things along the way and share it with other people and sit down in a long-form interview format and talk to some of the, the best leaders that are, are willing to speak with us? And, and I think that that's uh, – it was something I wanted to do before I met you, and it was a, just a dream, and you really brought it into action, which is one thing Dr. Downer said, that there's a, there's the action piece. I remember you have to do things in between the meetings to <laughs> make sure that you're ready to move forward at the meeting. And so uh, I just think that's great. And if there are any leaders out here that are a part of this or any of the uh, audience members or guests, we are we are willing to sit down and learn and help draw out some of the best practices. So. Uh, just uh, kind of a plug for the podcast in general, but also a plug for following up on your dreams so that these things don't just uh, live on someday aisle. And that was, uh, yes. I remember, you know, Bert, Brian Tracy or so they've talked about your, if you're not careful, your dreams and your, your goals will live on someday aisle. And that's not a place. It's, uh, yeah, there's seven days in the week and Sunday's not one of them. So, no. Uh, so what do you think, Dr. Owens? Always, uh, I try to, let you uh, speak so I don't take all the oxygen out of the room. I love to hear your parting words. No, my parting words are, are as they always are. You know, we say around here, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in the seeds. When you teach, you never know how many lives you influence. And it is clear that the guests we have brought on this podcast are influential in the city. Um, and I think you kind of brought it out. We're doing a, a, a unique thing, I think. We're highlighting 
the great things and the great people, men, women, black, white, purple, green, or yellow, in the city of Louisville. And hopefully we're doing it and, and giving the opportunity to branch out and launch into a national audience so that the world knows what's going on in Louisville. Um, we know um, over the summer that there was a little bit of civil unrest and 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 and, and maybe people don't see Louisville as, as, as a great place or as us doing great things. But I think this podcast is a highlight to show that we're doing great things and the people in Louisville are doing great things. And we're going to highlight that and give it to, through the lens of leadership and learning, but we're going to promote and push um, the great things that the people in Louisville are doing. And we're going to, when we have this platform, I think that's a, a great way to do it. And I think as quiet as this kept, you know, hopefully we're making some type of impact and, and being influential in the lives of the people that we interview just as much as they're having an impact and, and influencing our lives as well. Uh, there was a campaign in, uh, I'm trying to think if it was 2006, 2007, but uh, Louisville was possibility city mm-hmm. where, where blue collar, white collar, no collar came together. The, the only place except for the washing machine where they they all got to, <laughs> to come together if it's possibility city. And I still see Louisville that way. And um, we did have a lot of uh, unrest uh, in 2020 and a lot of friends around the country reaching out to me, everything okay there. And, mm-hmm. and uh, there are some issues that, that need to be worked on, need to be addressed. And I think a lot of the leaders that we've had on so far are facing those and, and talking about them and, uh, squarely dealing with how to continue to make Louisville better. And I, I love what you just said about how we're showing uh, through this humble platform, how all the talent that is in this city and, and we're going to continue to do it as long as we can, Dr. Owens. So you, thank you for your time as well. No problem. So Cardinal nation, keep listening to this podcast, keep learning, keep influencing, and we hope to see you soon. But until then, don't forget to like, subscribe, and drop as many comments as you need in the comment box so that you can be updated when new podcasts are dropping as they drop every Friday and you have information connected to the OLO program as it is released. So until then, take care and stay safe.